Good morning, Ignite Church. It is so good to see all of you. Thank you for being here today. Those of you that are visiting with us, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. To to start this time off, I feel like I have to just tell on myself, uh, confess something to all of you. Of course, on on Friday, when we began to really see the reality that the, the hurricane wasn't going to be for Greenville, what we thought that it could be earlier in the week, and our staff, we're, we're texting each other, and we're trying to figure out, you know, what do we do about Sunday, and, and, and we're feeling really led to have a service, and we're trying to figure out, do we do, we do our normal schedule of a 9, 15, and 11, or do we do, we do something different, and, and I just want to confess to you guys, I was that one that was saying, um, our, the, the, the college students are gone, a- ECU has, has said that they won't be back till Wednesday, and, and if, you're, if you've never been a part of our church, normally, they really are guys, they're like 300 people <laughs> of our church, so I'm like, you know, we have enough for them on a normal good Sunday. Surely we won't be full <laughs> on the hurricane weekend. Um, so I'm, feeling, I'm feeling pretty chastised by God right now. <laughs> if I'm honest with all of you, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for, for, for um, giving us this time to come and worship Jesus with us as, as we learn from him. For all of those of you that, that are watching online because I, we're, we're trying to stream. And I know there are some folks uh, down in Aiden and some other areas that they just they couldn't get here. Our love and our prayers are with you. And if you're here today, um, as that was mentioned earlier, because you're, you're staying next door at the Hilton or the Hampton because you, you've lost a home. Yeah, or you've, you've lost where you're at. We're so thankful that you're here with us. And, and I mean it with all of my heart. Please let us know how we can come alongside you how we can pray for you, and how we can be a part of God blessing and restoring your life because we really, 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 really want to be a part of that work. Um, That was being impressed upon me very, very heavily as we were worshiping this morning. Um, If you were here last week, one of the things that our uh, amazing college pastor, Pastor Josh, shared is that with, with all of our church family, we kind of had a had kind of an in-house moment where he was sharing the fact that we're getting very close to our building being finished, and, and we're, we're a couple of tens of thousand dollars away from, from having it finished out. And I know that the storm has nothing to do with Ignite Church. I mean, God's so much bigger, and the Big C Church is so much bigger than that, but I, I felt like Jesus was, was saying to me, you know, there, there, that wasn't necessarily a coincidence for us. That we're in a place where it's real easy for us to, to, to be in need and to want to take for us so that we can finish this thing that we feel like God's telling us to do. And I felt like Jesus was saying, are you going to hold on to what you have or are you going to give to the bigger kingdom of Christ? And I want you guys to know, if I have anything to say about it, I know our staff's completely on line with this too. We're giving to the big C church kingdom of Christ. Can I get an amen to that? And so um, we, I, I mean it when I say it, if you know of needs, Please let us know. We can't do everything for everyone. We are one church body, but we're a pretty big church body. Look around, and we want to be a part um, of healing um, the lives that are hurting. If you guys will, go ahead and open up your worship guides and turn with me uh, to, uh, again, for many of you, a pretty familiar story. We are looking at the life of David, one of the, one of the great figures of the Old Testament, uh, someone who was attributed to having God's own heart. And last week, if you weren't with us, we talked about that reality that, that this prophet named Samuel... I uh, came before David, he'd rejected, God had rejected Saul, and, and God had said, I was looking, I'm looking for someone who has my heart, and he went and, and raised up this young man and anointed him to be the future king of Israel, and, and then, of course, David went back to the field, and it was through his willingness to serve in small capacities that God prepared him through the lion and through the bear to, to face Goliath. And, and, to, and to have this stage where he can have national recognition. And, and where we're looking now, guys, his, his story has taken a very, very dramatic turn. And, and again, I felt like last week was perfect for, for, for what it was, even though we planned it months in advance because we, we kicked off our Say Yes campaign because we, we know going into the new space that it is going to be crazy, it's going to be busy. By the way, just for any of you guys that, that were thinking about that, just understand that when we move into our new building in November, every Sunday probably for... The rest of this year and certainly the beginning of next year is going to be like today, both services. It is going to be packed. You're going to have to be generous with seats. You're going to have to do things you wouldn't normally want to do because we really are believing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new people are going to come and and, and want to worship with us and check out what God is doing here at Ignite. Um, To to celebrate, first of all, I believe we had somewhere around, and this is not a perfectly correct number, I apologize for that, but somewhere around 130 needs, and I just want to say thank you to all of you. Out of that roughly 130, I believe it was 84 say yeses were made. Can we just celebrate that? Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, overwhelming majority of you were willing to say yes. Um, If you were wondering, if some of you were there last week and you're like, you know what, I'll help if I'm really needed, but let let other people pull the slips first and then we'll see. Well, as you can see, we still need about 50 more people to rise up 
um, and say yes to serving God. And again, every Sunday is going to be like this. And so the, the boards are back out there. The opportunities are there. And you can really be a part of people being blessed by Jesus um, by serving in small ways. And you say, how that was perfect? This is perfect. Because David's story, David's story. Um, he has risen to the highest of heights. He was the slayer of Goliath. He was the one that the maidens sang about in Jerusalem. Saul kills his thousands, and David kills his ten thousands. This guy was, this, David was unstoppable, y'all. He was unstoppable as a warrior. He was unstoppable as a poet. He's playing music for, for King Saul because Saul's being tormented by an evil spirit. He was unstoppable in everything that he did. Everything he did, God blessed him. And rose him up. David had an eye out for Saul's daughter. She was a beautiful young woman and, and wanted to marry her. And she wanted to marry him. And so Saul said, well, go and get me the 100 foreskins of the Philistines. Why foreskins? I don't know. That's gross. But whatever. You know, kill 100 men is really what he was asking him to do. And, and David went out. When David came back, Saul said, have you, got my, have you got my prizes? And David said, I didn't kill 100. I killed 200 men uh, for you. So this guy, anything that he did, he, he met and exceeded the expectations and and everyone knew there was something very special about David, including, including his king, a man named Saul. And you saw a brief clip of Saul talking to Jonathan in our little intro where it's saying he'll want the kingdom next. And so Saul begins to, to, to believe that David is vying for his throne. He begins to believe that, that David is manipulating and trying to go behind his back and steal the crown from him. Saul completely forgetting that he stole the crown from himself and God's already given the crown to David. Um, but but when, you're, when, you're, when you're in a place that Saul is at, that doesn't matter, doesn't make sense. And so Saul begins to have a lot of bitterness and animosity towards David, eventually leading in Saul's desire to kill David. And so the story we're looking at today really illustrates David um, in one of the lowest points of his life. And if you are here with us today because, because you've lost a home you may have lost a workplace. You may have lost, you know, a lifetime's worth of possessions. You may not know what the situation is of some family members. For some of you that may be in this room and, and you feel like you're, you're down in the dust, this story, again, the Holy Spirit has prepared it for you. Um, because we planned it months out in advance, but he knew exactly what was going to happen and, and where we were going to be at today. But David, who again is the anointed king of Israel, he's being chased by the current king of Israel for his life. He's sleeping in the dirt. He's running for his life. There's a period here where David actually has to run into the camp of the Philistines to be saved from the people of Israel. And he goes to the, the, uh, one of the Philistine cities and acts like a madman so the Philistines won't kill him. I mean, it is a low point for the life of David. But even in the lowest points of his life, God is faithful. And we, we, we kind of sang about that just a little while ago. There's breath in our lungs. We're going to continue to worship. And David, David, even though he had every opportunity for bitterness against God, every opportunity for resentment against God, God, I thought you anointed me, and now look, look where you put me. He didn't do that. He continued to have faith. He continued to worship. He continued to trust. And God put men around David that were faithful, God-fearing, incredibly brave men. And so David kind of develops. He's almost like a real-life Robin Hood, y'all, for real. He's, almost, he's, like he's, he's got this camp in the woods. The, 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 the king and the government's chasing after him. They can't find him because he always outsmarts them. You know, it's, just, it's one of those crazy things that it's real. I mean, this is, the, this is history that we're reading. And he's always one step ahead of Saul. And we're going to see here him treating Saul with some very unusual honor when he had every opportunity to seek revenge for what Saul had done to him. So let's just jump into our story. 1 Samuel 24, verses 2 through 4. I want to encourage you, of course, read the entirety of the story because it is so, so good. It says, Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel, and they went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend his needs. Now David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Look, this is the day the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose, and he secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And so, again, just to lay this out very, very simply, you know, Saul catches wind that, that, that David, this now notorious criminal, on the run for his life, there's been a sighting of David. And so Saul says, okay, there's been a sign of David. Let's rise up the military. Let's go chase down this wanted criminal. Let's bring him to justice, which basically means we're going to go kill him. And, and so Saul and 3,000 men go to do that. Somewhere along the journey, uh, Saul begins to feel um, a little bit perhaps of indigestion. 
you know, and there, and there, and there, and there, was, there were no medicines for that. There was no tomes. You know, there was nothing like that. And so Saul, who is on this mission to kill David, and sees the cave. And he says, you know what, guys? I need to go use the restroom. Kings have to do that too, you know? And, 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 and because he was the king, it was very important for Saul to maintain an air of nobility and superiority. For those of you who don't understand much about you know, typical kingships, it is not appropriate for the king to be human. They're not human. They're people that are, di- that are something more than human. They're chosen by the gods. And so Saul might not have told them exactly what he was doing in the cave. Saul definitely did not bring guards with him into the cave because it was not appropriate for anyone to be in the presence of the king when the king is taking care of his needs, as the Bible so eloquently and graciously says. And so Saul goes into the cave to, to take care of his business, his private time. And who is in the cave but David and all of his army? You know, hide now. Like, they're there in the cave. And so when they see who comes in, and they obviously, rec- I mean, get, remember, Saul, he is literally a head taller than every other man in Israel. The Bible says that he was a head taller than every, Saul's instantly recognizable. And so they see him coming into the cave. There's, there's a lot of, of, of David's men in the cave, and so they're whispering to him, David, this is, this is God. Like, what are the odds ever that Saul would come into a place where he is alone and our whole army is with us. I mean, what, when is that ever going to happen again? And look, the kid, he literally has his pants down. <laughs> I mean, come on. It is hard to swing a sword when you, you know, like, yeah. Like, you, you're never going to have a more prime opportunity than this moment. Surely, I mean, again, and this is interesting because they're trying to use God's voice and God's word to convince David to do what they want him to do. Surely the Lord has constructed these events so that you can seek justice for the wrongs that Saul has done against you. And it seems that David is at least partially swayed by them because instead of allowing the king to have his private moment, David, apparently who was very stealthy, or apparently Saul had some headphones on and was just doing his own thing, I don't know. But David somehow, in the midst of this, I don't want to be too gross or anything, but he wanders up Saul and cuts off the corner of his robe. So he's he's right there where he could have killed him, and he chooses not to do it. Today, what we're going to be talking about is is the power of of showing honor. And if you want to go ahead and take on our first point, guys, our first point is this. Respect is earned, but honor is given. You see, there's there's a tremendous difference between respect and honor. And I think that sometimes our culture confuses the two and gets the two mixed up. Respect is a response to, to, to the actions of those around us. So, so when someone does something that is respectful or worthy of respect, this thing inside of us, it kind of rises up to the top of saying, you know, yeah, like, I, I admire that person. I, that person made the right decision. I, I, I respect them. So respect is something that most of us, we start kind of at a, at a low level. But as we get to know someone who is worthy of respect, we begin to admire and respect them more and more and more. The Bible talks very little, Ignite Church, about respect. But it talks a ton about honor because honor is different. Honor is not something that is earned. It is something that you choose to give because of who you are in Jesus. I have the blessing of officiating lots and lots and lots of weddings. It's, and it's a lot of fun. Um, I, I, I am right now, um, my next wedding will, will literally be, because I keep count of them, it's 134 than 133 weddings. I did one last weekend at the beach. I'm so glad it was then and not this weekend because that beach is gone, y'all. Anyway, sorry. It probably is. It was on top soil, and even that weekend, the, the tide was coming in real close to where we had a ceremony. Um, and, and in weddings, if you, and those of you who are married, you might remember this. For very, very common wedding lines is that we talk about honoring. As a matter of fact, most of the time when I lead couples in vows, the vow that we, that we share is a promise to honor that person. Because see, honor doesn't have to be earned. Honor does not have to be deserved. Honor isn't something you have to build up. Honor has to do with you and God and how you're choosing to treat that person. And so those of you that are couples, and sometimes your, your, your spouse is not respect worthy, yeah, you don't have to respect everything they do, but the Bible requires and the Lord requires that you honor them anyway. At our, at our staff, um, there are a lot of times that our, our incredible pastors maybe disagree with, with, with me and with some of the things that, that I do. I'm so far from perfect. And I'm so blessed and, and so thankful that even when they disagree with me, they choose to honor me 
because of, of what's happening between them and Jesus. And we see here David in this moment with Saul where he could have raised the knife or raised the sword and taken his life. He chooses to honor him, not because of what Saul has done, but because of who David is in relation to God. We see in 1 Samuel 24, 5, it says, Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had done what, Ignite? What had David done? He cut Saul's robe. I wouldn't have been sorry at all if I'd done it. I mean, Saul deserved a lot more than a cut in his clothing. But the reason why David felt that way is because he understood that there's, there's more going on than, 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 than me and Saul. You see, Saul was the anointed king of Israel, and that had nothing to do with how he was treating David. It had everything to do with, with the position that God had given to him. And most of us in this room, we, we are under the authority of someone else. If you, if you work in a business and you have a boss, and you're under someone's authority. If you're a student here and you have teachers, you're under their authority. If you're, if, if you're, even if you're a business owner here, we have the, the ultimate authority of, of God. All of us are men and women under authority. And there are times when it's easy to honor the authority in front of us. And there are other times when it's really hard to do that. There are some of you in this room, let's just, can we just be real in church? Some of you in this room are smarter than your boss. Anybody want to say amen? And all the staff at Ignite says, yeah, and they'd be right. And they'd be exactly right to say that. They probably would, yeah. Um, yeah, like some of you, you you're, you're smarter than your boss. You're more talented than your boss. You do a better job than your boss. Some of you students, man, you know things that your teachers are never going to dream of knowing. And you can teach the class better than they could. And yet, it's hard to respect someone like that. But the Bible requires that we honor them in the position that God has given them. Um, for me, one of those people in my life, y'all, was a guy named, named Tony. I'm not going to share his last name um, lest, lest uh, someone see this video because I, I want to honor him. But there was a, a, a leader in my life who was a pastor that was in a position of authority over me when I was a youth pastor many, many, many years ago. And, um, and, and guys, he was a hard boss. He was a pastor of a church. He was very traditional. He was, he was one of those straight-laced guys. I remember uh, getting chewed out one day right before service happened because I came in with my shirt, my tie, my penny loafers. Yes, I had penny loafers. And I had the braided belt that looped through and went down. You know what I'm saying? Because that was like, yeah, 90s, man. It was awesome. I, 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 but I thought I was looking good. And, and he reamed me at one side and the other because I had collar buttons, and they weren't buttoned. And for him, that just, you know, you, you, you got you to gotta have every piece together. And this guy sometimes was very hard to honor, and, and, and yet I had to try to do that. And I'll never forget, about five years ago, um, I was taking a young man at a, who, was, who was part of Ignite. So we went out to the Skylight Inn to get some barbecue and uh, some cornbread, of course. You got to get some cornbread, too. And, um, and who happened to be there but, but, but Pastor Tony. He was there with, with some friends of his, and, uh, and, and, and I went to him. Uh, and, and, of course, trying to honor him, legitimately trying to honor him, you know, you know, telling this guy, this guy helped raise me up in ministry. He taught me so many things. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking he taught me so many things not to do. You know, but, like, he taught me so many things he showed me. And he did. I mean, God, God used my relationship with him to learn so many things, just as, just as what's happening with David and Saul, and, and really played him up. And we went and got our barbecue, and I, I'll, I'll never forget that, you know, he was talking to his friends, and he had a loud boom voice, but he had a pastor's voice. I don't have a pastor's voice. I have a Joe Osteen voice. You're bland. You know, like, and, it, and it's not good, but he had, a, he had, like, one of those booming, like, voices that I really, like, envy, you know, like, yeah, I can't even pretend to do it. But he had one of those voices, and, and he was telling, the, he was telling some of his guys, he said, the way that, oh, oh, and we had literally just had one of our biggest baptisms the Sunday before, 38 people at Ignite Church, so it was a real high time in, our, in, our, in, in my, like, you know, I remember him telling his guys, the way that they do church, they think that the way we do church isn't right. So he was kind of bad-mouthing Ignite and, and us. And, 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 and this guy who was a little bit younger than me, he was a college student, he's like, you need to go over there and tell him that we baptized 38 people. He's probably never baptized 38 people in his own ministry. And it might be true. It might be true. You know, I don't know. But, you know, he, he was like, he was like incensed because he could hear him talking too. And I had to have that moment where it's like, yeah, am I going to go, you know, the, the guy's pants are down. <laughs> and am I going to go kick him? Because I could. Because I could. I could have humiliated him in front of his friends. And, and what I said is, no, nah, I said, we, we just got to go over there and love him and bless him and, and, and pray for him. So that's what we did is we went and, and we just said, hey, hey, listen, we're about to leave. Can we just pray over your ministries? And like, what's he going to say then? No. I mean, no. I, uh, you, no. And so, and so we prayed over them. 
and, and, and walked out. And, and, and now Pastor Tony is with the Lord. And I can't wait to see him and, and, and because I, I really believe that God used him to do things we couldn't. So I say that to say, for those of you that are in positions where it's hard to honor someone, God's using that person, God's using that position, show them honor, not because they deserve it, but because our God deserves it through us. Let's continue in the story really quick, man. This is so, all so good. Again, David's hurting here. It's hard. And this is how we honor others. First of all, guys, the way that, that we honor others and, and, and the ability we use in honoring others, it does a couple things. Number one, it prohibits or unleashes the power of God. One of the reasons why David chose to honor Saul, even though Saul didn't deserve it, is because David understood the reality that we are spiritual beings and what we do in this life resonates in the spiritual world. Let me say that to you again. You are more than flesh and bone. You are more than a collection of cells. You are more than what the world can see. You are a spiritual being, and you are an eternal being. And because of that, what we do, it ripples out in invisible ways in eternity. And David really understood the reality of that. Look at what he says to his men when he goes back. And they're mad he didn't kill Saul. And David's mad at himself because he cut off the corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do anything. This thing to my master. He's the Lord's anointed. I want you guys to circle that. Circle that. He's the Lord's anointed. Whether he loves me or whether he hates me. Whether he wants to lift me up or whether he wants to grind me down. Whether he wants to elevate me as the son that I should be. Or whether he wants to chase me down as a wanted criminal. Either way, he is the Lord's anointed and I will honor that anointing. To stretch out my hand against him, he's the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with those words. He did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave, and he went on his way. Um, just for those of you who like weird, interesting, semi-gross facts from the Bible, that last sentence confirms 100%. If any of you were wondering, was it number one or number two? <laughs> two, okay? He got up. You don't get up. Most men, can I, say, can I get an amen from my brothers? We don't get up from number one. There was a hole. Yeah, yeah, it was like that. Okay, enough said, sorry, I don't want to go down near the kids. But like, so, so literally, he is in the most, he's in the most humble, humiliating, open, vulnerable position that any person can be in. And, and one of the things, I don't know, I'm, I am a weird guy, but one of the things sometimes that just helps me on hard days is understanding the reality that even the most blessed person, even the greatest person, even the richest person, even the most famous person, all of us have to have this moment where every once in a while, we humble ourselves and sit on a white throne before the Lord. You know, every one of us. There is no one exempt from that. If you're exempt from that, you're not a human, okay? Like, and, and so he's having one of those, those moments. And, and David's restraining his men and allows him to, to leave scot-free. And David's reasoning is important. He's saying, no, no, listen. You guys are saying I need to get revenge because of what he's done to me. I'm saying that I have to stay my hand because of who he is to God. You see, sometimes we don't honor other people because we forget that those men and women who seem to be in our way, those men and women to seem to have no value of all, those men and women were created in the image of God. Their names are known by God and they are loved by God. And we have to choose to honor some of those people in our life. Um, you guys write a couple things down. There's no blanks for this, but just write down, I've shared this before, but scenery, machinery. Scenery and machinery. Scenery and machinery. If we're honest with ourselves, most of the people that cross our path and intersect in our life, they are either scenery in the background of our life or they're machinery. What I mean by that is they're people in our life that can do something for us. You see, sometimes that's, again, with, for those that are having issues in relationships. Again, I have such a blessing to do so much counseling. The reason why there are issues is because we've, we've, we've forgotten that We've forgotten that marriage is not about us being served. It's about us serving. And sometimes we say, oh, that person's going to make me happy. That person's going to meet my need. That person's going to do whatever. And if you believe that about somebody other than Jesus, you're going to be very disappointed. Can I get an amen to that? I have an amazing wife, but she is not called to be my source of life and joy. Jesus is. And if I begin to look to her to fill those needs, I'm going to be disappointed in her. She's going to be disappointed in me, and both of us are going to miss what Jesus has. For us. 
the way that we interact with most people in the world is this person can either do something for us or they're just in the background. Many of you, let's just, again, I, and I love, I do, I love all of you, and I have the unique position of being in this place where I am kind of a spiritual father to, to you. And so I, I'm in this place where I can love you without expecting anything from you, but many of you, I'm your pastor, right? And so, like, yeah, I'm, I'm, he's supposed to be there to meet my need. He's supposed to be there to marry my child. Not marry them, but officiate their marriage. He's supposed to be there... <laughs> We're not, we don't live in Midwest. No, anyway, like, he's supposed to be there when I die. He's going to be the one to close my casket and say, no, I think, you know, there, there are things that there's, you expect me to do for you, and that's okay, but don't we treat most people that way? Like, either they're just in the background of our life, or they're people that can do something for us. And Jesus is saying, no, see people for what they really are, eternal spiritual beings created in the image of God, deserving of respect and honor on their good days and on their bad days. I've given you the Greek word for without honor. It's atimos. And what it means, it means to dishonor or to treat as common or ordinary. And the reason why I gave you that word first, we're going to, take the, we're going to look at the word for honor in just a second, but the reason why I gave you that word first is whenever we treat a person that intersects our life as something other than who they really are, an eternal spiritual being, we're treating them as ordinary when in reality they are not. You've never met an ordinary person. An ordinary person doesn't exist because every single person your life crosses a, passes across, every one of them may be someone that God is going to do something so incredible in their life, in the next life, because they're a spiritual being. And they might not look impressive now, but you have no idea what God has waiting for them. In Mark 6, we see people treating Jesus without honor, and we see how it limits the power of the Holy Spirit in that city, in that community. Ignite Church, I want you to know something about me and about our staff. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe that this church is a spirit-filled, supernatural entity. Now, again, just like last week, no snakes coming out, no crazy oils being cast, nothing like that. But we believe you are more than what I can see. And there are some of you in this room, you need to understand that if you don't honor those around you, God's ability to work through your life supernaturally is hindered in incredible ways. Look at what the Bible says, Mark 6, 1. It says, Jesus left there. And he went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. And they took offense at him. And so Jesus, who was the carpenter, comes back now as the prophet, as the leader, as the teacher, as the miracle worker. And people are like, who does he think he is? I changed his diapers back in the day. And some of them probably did. I used to run, run through the streets playing, playing ball with him in the day. And some of them probably did. And Jesus said to his disciples, only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet, Atimos, without honor. And Jesus, now look at this, it's interesting. Jesus could not do miracles there. That's a big deal. He's the son of God. And, 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 I, and I've checked the Greek heavily on this. It's not that he would not. Jesus could not, because of their lack of faith, because of their lack of trust, and because of their lack of honor, he could not do everything that he wished that he could do in that city. Ignite Church. We will not be that church. Can I get an amen to that? We're not going to be that church that God says, oh, I have all this plan for them. I have all these blessings planned for them, all these miracles planned for them, all these opportunities to serve them. But because they just don't believe and don't trust, because they don't honor one another, because they don't honor me, I can't. We're going to be the church that shows honor so that God can do everything through us. It says he was amazed, in verse 6, at their lack of faith. How we honor others, it either prohibits or it unleashes the power of God in our lives. Number two, guys, write this down. This is so big in the story we're about to read. How we honor others, it either builds bridges or it builds walls of our, in our influence. So again, this, this, this time that David has, this is an opportunity either to, to build up walls and do what, do what feels good or to build bridges of influence. And we're going to see that he does the right thing even in his pain and even in his hurt. First Samuel 24, 6. It says, David also arose afterward and he went out of the cave and he called out to Saul. So Saul now has left the cave, but apparently he is still in a position where he's kind of alone. The army is still a distance off. He called out to Saul and he says, my Lord the king. And look at, look at what David does. This is so interesting. He says, when Saul looked behind him, so he turned around, David stooped and put his face to the earth 
and he bowed down. You see, the reason why men and women would bow in the presence of the king, it was an act of complete submission, saying, if you want my life, my life belongs to you. My neck is bared, my eyes are downcast, my hands are completely outward and open, I am no threat to you, and you have the power of life and death over me. So David, knowing that Saul wants to kill him, goes to Saul and bows down in front of him. What faith this man had. He says, look, this day, your eyes have seen the Lord delivered you into my hand in the cave. And look, and some, someone urged me to kill you. Yeah, he threw those guys under the bus. That's exactly what he did. He urged me to kill you. Some of those guys, I ain't saying name, but maybe, you know, some of them. Yeah, but my eye, my eye spared you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord. And here's his reason. Because he's the Lord's anointed. God has chosen you, Saul, in this time in your life, in this time in my life, to be an authority. God's chosen you to be the leader. God's chosen you to be the king. And I honor that. I don't respect you very much because you are crazy. But I honor you. And I would not dare raise my hand against you. Because I know God doesn't make mistakes and he's put you in this position for this season. And when God is finished with you, he will take you out of the position. And those of you who know the story of David know God does exactly that. You see, what David shows to, to, to Saul is the true definition of honor. And I've given you that word. It's the Greek word, teme. Uh, you guys can say that. One, one, two, three, teme. And what it means, guys, is it means to value. It means to respect. It means to highly esteem. It means to treat something as precious, weighty, or valuable. And so when we, when we teme someone that, that to the world they don't see the value but we see the spiritual value we, we, we do something interesting you see David didn't just do this for Saul although he saw the big part of it David was doing this for the men in the cave because you know those guys in the cave were watching and they were seeing David's faith and they were learning what it meant to honor and they were seeing that God could be trusted because, I mean, hey look, Saul's in a position where right now all he has to do is literally take a few steps pull out the sword and go and David's head is off his shoulders but David knew, David knew that Saul wasn't going to do that. Why, do you, why did David know that? Because God had already said, you are the what? The king. He ain't a headless king. David, know, like, David knew, he believed in that. God has already declared where I'm going. I already know my destiny. Because I know my destiny, I can trust my God. Ignite Church, do you remember where you're going? You have a home in the city of Zion. You have a position of value and respect with the king of kings, the co-heir of Jesus Christ. You are going to be someone that the Bible says one day will judge the angels. And because you know who you are and where you're going, can you show honor today even to those that don't deserve it in your life? Look at the bridge that David builds by his submission and by his honor. This is Saul. It says, then he, that, that, that's Saul if you want to write it. Then Saul said to David, he said, David, you are more righteous than I. And I want to say, Captain Obvious. Yeah, but anyway, sorry. You are more righteous than I. For you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. And look at this. This is the part I want you to like underline or circle. And now I know indeed you shall surely be what? The king. This is like Saul, I mean, this is a moment of clarity for Saul. And Saul had a spirit of madness upon him. It wasn't all Saul's fault. God was doing some things and Satan were doing some things in Saul's life here. But for a moment, he, get, he gets it. His eyes are open. Only a king would show this kind of honor. Only God's chosen could do the thing that you've done for me today. And so now, if I had any questions in the past as to whether you will be the king, I have no questions. I know you are the king of Israel. Still don't want to give you my crown. Still don't want to hoist you on my shoulders and take you back triumphantly to the army so they can celebrate you. But I know who you are. You will be the king. And look at what he continues to say. He says, the kingdom of Israel shall be established by your hand. Therefore, therefore, because Saul says, I know, I know, I know it's been written now. I see it. Therefore, swear to me now by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me, that you will not destroy my name from my father's house. And so Saul's basically saying, look, I understand that you're supposed to be the king. 
And so that means somehow I'm going to die because I can't be the king and you be the king at the same time. And I know that when that happens, somehow Jonathan, who would normally be the king, my son, somehow he's not going to be the king, you're going to be the king. So I don't know what's going to happen to my son. Will you just promise me that you'll make sure that my bloodline doesn't die out forever because I know that you're going to have the power to wipe out the name of Saul if you want to. When David swears to him, he would continue to honor his name. There are some of you, and this is, the, this is where the rubber meets the road, guys. Some of you, again, you need to go home after this and call somebody. Show them honor. You have a family member you haven't talked to in a while. Show them honor, not because they deserve it, but because Jesus deserves it through your life. Some of you, you need to go visit and check on someone because you don't know how they're doing in the storm, and you're assuming they're okay, but it will rock their world that you cared enough to go and visit them and make sure they're okay. Some of you, again, because of the craziness of your life, you've, you've forgotten about the fact that there are so many that have lost homes, that are dealing with flooding, that are doing it, and you have opportunity this week to honor them by saying no to yourself and yes to their needs. Honor them. And when you do... It will build bridges of connections in your life that God and the Holy Spirit can use in incredible and crazy ways. Last point, how we honor, it changes generations. It changes complete generations. This isn't just something that deals with us. The way that you honor one another, the way that you honor the people in your life, the way you teach your children to honor the people in their life, it transforms and changes generations. And there could be a day that, that, that someone could look back generation after generation after generation and understand that you were the difference maker. And this happens in the story of David because, of course, Saul does die, and Jonathan as well. David is elevated into the place of of kingship, and next week when we come together, we're going to see him uh, bringing the, the Ark of the Covenant with, with joy and worship into, into Jerusalem as the king of Israel. And so he becomes the king, and as, as being the king, he never forgets the promise he made to Saul in that dusty, dirty cave when he was on the run, and he asked, does, does Saul and Jonathan have any descendants? Because I want to honor them. I want to lift up that family. I promised before the Lord that I would do that. And, and I've, 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 I've conquered enemies. I've brought back the ark. I've, I've done all my kingly duties. And now I have a chance to really think about that family. And I want to make sure I honor that family. And, and sure enough, Jonathan did have a, a son that when the craziness of the transition of power went on, this son, he was, he was ran out of the palace of Jerusalem. And as he was escaping Jerusalem, the nursemaid that was holding him fell and crushed his feet. So he was lame in both feet. Now, just so you understand, in Israel, if you were a cripple, it was because God hates you and is punishing you. They really believed that. They believed that people with deformities and diseases and disabilities and handicaps, those were punishments from God. And so you can guess how this person who was the king of the guy who tried to kill the current king, and he can't walk, this guy probably had a very difficult life. His name was I can't ever say it correctly. I have a lisp. I'm sorry. <laughs> like It's one of those evil names. Um, we're going to read about how David elevates and honors him. 2 Samuel 9, 6 and 7. It says, Now when Mephibosheth, that's how you say it, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face. He prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth? In other words, is that you? Because remember, David, David loved Jonathan. He, he knew Mephibosheth when he was a little boy. But now this little boy is a grown man. And he's, and he's lame, broken begging for his life on the ground, man. And so he says, is it you? And he answers, here, here is your servant. So the very place that David was outside the cave, on his face, arms outstretched, now Saul's bloodline is doing the same thing to him. And David said to him, do not fear. The very same thing, by the way, that Jesus said to the disciples in that boat that Stephen mentioned, do not be afraid. For I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan and your father's sake. I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you will eat bread at my table continually. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. So much easier. Thank you, Jesus. Micah, I can say that one good. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, and he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame. In both his feet. And so what David basically did, y'all, to make this real simple, I know our time is, is, is over. David took this guy who, who, who was like reviled and despised, and he raised him up to the highest place. Mephibosheth might not have had the girls looking at him before, but the man who eats at the king table, he is a catch. 
people might not have thought about much of his life, but the man who had the right hand seat of the king, he's eating with the king's family. That guy, he's important. He's powerful. Saul owned vast territories and lands. All of those were taken away. And David says, all of them, you get them back. You're one of the most powerful, influential, wealthy men in Israel. What did Mephibosheth, I can't say it, Mephibosheth do? Nothing. He didn't do anything to earn it. He didn't do anything to deserve it. David chose to honor him. And the takeaway for today is I want to beg and plead with all of you. Find someone in your life. Find the Mephibosheth in your life. The person that doesn't seem worthy of your honor, worthy of your time, worthy of your attention. Honor them. Because as you do, the power of God will be unleashed. Bridges will be built. And you never know who's watching you, but as you honor others, you will change generations. Paul says this, Romans 12, 10. Love one another with brotherly affection and outdo one another in showing what? What does it say, Ignite? Honor. Outdo one another in showing honor. Let's honor our city this week. Let's honor the broken this week. And let's be a part of Jesus doing miracles as we honor others' lives in his name. Let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, today has been a good day for us to come together to be able to praise your name even in the midst of the storm, to be able to celebrate your goodness even for those that are hurting and have lost so much, and to be reminded that, that we have the power and the capacity to supernaturally show honor even when it's not earned or deserved. We have the power and the capacity to build bridges of love, bridges of grace, bridges of influence and connection that our eyes cannot see the end of by the way we honor one another. I think that there are some generation changers in this room where, where they, they grew up in a culture where honor was not extended, but because they're choosing to be the giver of honor, they're choosing to be the initiator of honor, they'll change generations forever. And when it comes down to it, Jesus, we honor one another and we honor the broken and the lost because you honored us. If there was ever, ever someone who didn't deserve love, deserve grace, and deserve to be honored, it's, it's, it's all of us in this room. And that's not a slide. It's just your word says that even our best day dirty rags in your sight and we have the king of kings the lord of lords the god of god jesus perfect and pure and he looked down at our sin he looked down at our darkness he looked down at our brokenness and he said to himself do they deserve my life no do they deserve my grace no do they deserve heaven's forgiveness no do they deserve for me to come and be one of them to love them to live with them and to die for them no but Father, I choose to honor them. I honor them with my life. I honor them with my blood. And I honor them so that they can go out and show the world what real honor looks like. I know there are some people in this room that you feel very far from God. And I want you to know He has honored you by giving you the greatest gift in all of creation, that being the life of his son. And, and that doesn't mean that we won't have storms. And that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that things won't at times be destroyed. But we have a God who is with us in the midst of the storm. We have a God of restoration with us in the, in the place of brokenness. We have a God that can rebuild anything. And I don't just, I don't, I'm not just talking about houses and lands. I'm, I'm talking about hearts. I'm talking about relationships. I'm talking about futures. I'm talking about eternity. He can rebuild your life. If you'll but call on his name, the name of Jesus. Because he promises all who call on my name, they shall be saved. Today and for eternity. And so if you're here today and you can see the call on the name of Jesus, I want you to know he loves you and he honors you by taking your place by paving your way so that you can be with the God of creation the God of love and the God of life for all eternity show him honor by trusting in his name today Jesus we love you we trust you in the storm 
And because you've honored us, allow us to be your image, going out to honor our city, honor our state, honor our country, and honor our world. Use us to be a reflection of you. Because everyone that's hurting, you love them. And maybe we can be your face to them too.